businesses then generate income that we were putting back into real estate. So at no point did we start padding our own pockets with that. It's really easy to fall into the trap of go buy all the toys and all the things. Instead, we reinvested it constantly back into real estate, back into businesses. Are you ready to transform your life? This is a no-nonsense show helping immigrants like you create generational wealth, even while working full-time. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Socket Jane. My great to us listeners, if you want to manage real estate, maybe you're ready for a lifestyle change. By selling your real estate, of course, you may have to pay substantial cap and gain taxes. One option that may help solve this is to learn about doing a 1031 tax deferred real estate exchange. Because you may be able to defer all of the capital gain taxes, and you could even exchange into a replacement property that may allow you to get rid of all of the headaches involved with being an active landlord. Ray Dewitt is a managing director with Bantanger Financial Services, and his goal is to help you understand all the rules associated with the 1031 exchanges. To learn more, visit their website at bantangerfinancials.com and browse the library of education material. Please be sure to see the disclosures and show notes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're listening from. My great two bustlers, today I have somebody who had made an interesting pivot in her career and it's going to make a very logical sense when I say what she did. She went from being a wildlife biologist to being a real estate investor, and now she does this full time. Very logical, right? Kind of like when she and I were talking about it's a logical progression of career, why would you not do it? So what intrigued me about her story is really how different things in life can shift your perspective and what you come out to become in the next 5, 10, 15 years of your journey could be a completely different person. So what you've been trained to do doesn't necessarily have to be the path you follow for the rest of your life. When I want you to listen to this show, I want you to listen to that from that perspective. If you're blocked, if you're thinking right now that I'm stuck, this is all I know, I don't know anything new, I don't have the right skill set, or whatever your negative spiral is right now, this show is going to probably provide you a few different perspectives of how somebody else who was probably in that shoe has unlocked their future and has created a very successful career for herself. Maria, with that, thank you for being on the show. I'm very excited to have a conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Maria, so we don't introduce people on this show usually beyond what I just said. What we go is your story is going to speak for you, right? So we're going to have a podcast going and the story is going to come out. So, But before we go there, when you heard the term migrate to wealth, what does that mean to you? I think it's a slow shift to a more secure place. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it is. I think a lot of people hear wealth and they picture fancy cars and airplanes. That's yeah. not what wealth means to me. It's security for my family. It's being able to spend time with my family when I need to because the income is coming in even if I'm not working for it day to day because right. there's a lot of passive involved there. I think that's what it means to me. And where are you on that path for yourself, Maria? I think, well, the end goal keeps shifting, right? So it's hard Always. to know how far away you are. But I think we're in a fairly comfortable position. If I don't do any work this year, we will be okay. We will mm -hmm. certainly be better if I work. So yeah. if that kind of puts in perspective. We have yes. businesses, and when I say we, it's me and my husband. We have businesses that are producing income for us. We have real estate that's producing income for us. And then additional work I do is on top of that, but the income does not stop. Love that. Maria, what's driving you to hit a goal? I mean, I know your story, so I kind of know what triggered you, but for the audience, what's driving you? Primarily, it's my first born son. His name is Carl and he has autism. And so my concern is that he may not be able to financially take care of himself for his full life, right? Even though he's highly intelligent, just a few points short of gifted actually, social skills are so hampered for some autistic individuals that they have a really hard time landing secure jobs, keeping them and getting promotions and really fulfilling their abilities, which is a shame because he's very capable, but there is that hindrance. I have to think long-term for him beyond my lifetime. So Maria, if that's okay, and you tell me if it becomes too painful, we'll stop, we'll shift different gears. So when you think about how, when did it trigger the thought came across? And I don't know much about autism, so I don't want to be disrespectful. So please keep that in perspective. When I'm saying something, there's no, <laughs> course, I, I have course. no intention to say, I understand what it means. When did that thought come to your mind that, you know what, I need to do something because 
whatever job or businesses you have at that time, if they were not passive, eventually, because there are two thoughts there. One is your life is limited, right? Because while you and your husband are alive, I'm sure you'll do everything in your power to, even if Carl's not able to take care of him financially, you'll be there. I think that's one concern that eventually you'll be gone. The second concern is what happens to Carl after we're gone or even while you're alive. Because if you're depending on an income from a corporate job or from your estate employee, eventually that's going to end and the pension may or may not be able to cover your lifestyle and the needs as Carl grows older, right? So if you can go back in time, what was that time? When did it happen? Was it a drastic shift you saw or something happened that triggered it? I think it was when he graduated high school, honestly. You're so busy as a parent of a special needs child, regardless of what that special need is. School time is just so hectic that you're just trying to get through the day to day, just get them through school. Like that is such a challenge that you don't really have time to think long term and long future. And if I could go back, I wish I would have started planning even earlier. Luckily, we were doing things just to secure our family in general. Mm-hmm. which where I hadn't really triggered on that whole idea that he's going to need this forever. But then you get out of school and it's like, whoa, adulthood's here. What's next? Yeah. And you start to realize adulthood is the biggest part of your life. Like right. that childhood goes by really quick. And now the whole rest of life is adulthood. And then I saw him struggling to try to find jobs and to keep jobs when he had them. And there was the whole college thing and he is doing the college route too. But have to take that sort of on a slow pace or becomes overwhelming because there's a lot of social involved there, trying to do jobs and just watching the struggle and realizing this isn't going away. This is a lifetime thing. So I think that's when it kind of hit me. If I don't start acting on this now, it may be too mm-hmm. late because tomorrow's not guaranteed. I want to think I'm going to be here to support him until I'm 100. But realistically, yeah. <laughs> I could get the old saying all the time, right? You know, get hit by a bus tomorrow. Although there aren't many buses in Florida, but something could be. Or me, perhaps. Right, right. So, no, I think that, that's know. interesting. So thank you for sharing that. So when you were in that situation, that aha moment happened that, you know what, I need to do something that's great. What did you do? Because a lot of people can just freeze in that, right? That why is it happening to me? Why did I have to do that? Why did it deserve it? And it could happen not just because of your situation. Whenever an adversity hits, and I'm calling this an adversity because it's not the normal mental model of people have sure. their life planned. So when, when that mental model gets challenged, the first question is, why me, right? Why did it happen to me? First of all, did you have that moment? Didn't really. Never went down the victim mentality. That's- we have a lot of friends who have special needs children who are far worse off. And I've seen their struggles. I've had friends who've lost children at very young ages, before the age of two even, to cancer and horrible other things. So I consider myself very fortunate. And I have a second child who's what we call neurotypical, because there's no such thing as normal, right? So neurotypical, meaning not diagnosed with anything. So we consider ourselves fortunate. So no, I never had that moment. Perfect. So what was the next step you did that? So now you had the realization, the epiphany hit you. And you wanted to take the next step. What did you do? Yeah. So, I mean, I had been investing in real estate actually all the way since college. So I invested in real estate long before Mm -hmm. I even started my biology career and did it as I was in my career because I knew as a state biologist, I would never make a good income, right? I was doing it because I was passionate about it because I loved it. Saving endangered species is something that just makes my heart glow and makes me happy, but it wasn't going to take care of my family. So I knew I had to do that. So I'd been doing that. So my first thought was just scale this more. I've been doing it at a very slow pace. So just scale it more while keeping my job. But then there were a lot of layoffs at my job. And people think, Mm. you know, you're working at a state state job. Yeah, they laid off like 150 people all at once. And no one knew who was coming or going. And that's uh, 750 people total, I believe it was. When was was this, Maria? I'm trying to remember what year it is. But it was the first time I kind of realized that even the state position is not as stable as it could be, right? Like somebody else is controlling my destiny here. It's time to take control of that myself. I've come from an entrepreneurial family. We have other businesses. So the entrepreneurial spirit just kicked in and said, you know, it's time to make the leap, go full time, go all in, burn the boats, the whole Mm. nine yards. So you quit the job before you found the path or you found the path and then quit the job? Well, I found the path. I did my research. I learned everything. I joined masterminds. I got educated. And then when I felt like I was ready, and of course, you never feel like you're 100% ready. But at some point before I had the big things, 
had bought a couple small multifamilies, but hadn't really done anything large, I took the leap because to really be good at this, you have to be all in. You just yeah. can't have a split focus. And it was taking way too much time away from my family, trying to keep a full-time job where I was working crazy hours out in the hot sun in Florida because it is not cold here. Mm. You're just exhausted at the end of the day when you're out in the field all day. And then spending my weekends and evenings doing real estate, there wasn't any time for the family. And that's not right either. If they're the ones I'm doing this for, I should spend some time with them. Definitely. Yeah, couldn't have that split focus anymore. And at that time, I know since then your husband has shifted his focus as well, but what was he doing at that time? So ironically, and this had nothing to do with planning, just somehow the signs lined up. My husband had been teaching special needs. So he was mm. a special needs education teacher before we had a special needs child. That just happened. It was sort of like right. the universe was getting him ready for that. And then he had moved into the entrepreneur world. So I mentioned we had some real estate. So we had some single family homes and we had used that equity to purchase the rights to build a massage and make clinic. Awesome. And so we did that in downtown Orlando. It did very well. And he ran all of that. That was all his show right. while I get my full-time job, right? And then eventually got a second clinic. And it was kind of nice because the real estate made it possible to start those businesses. And then when the businesses are successful, they generate income and you need write-offs. And <laughs> there's no better write-off than real estate, than real right? Estate. Definitely. Depreciation and all of those paper losses go a long yeah. way. The businesses then generate income that we were putting back into real estate. So at no point did we start padding our own pockets really with that. I mean, I'm not yeah. saying our lifestyle didn't improve a little bit, but it's really easy to fall into the trap of go buy all the toys and all the things. Instead, we reinvested it constantly back into real estate, back into businesses. I love that story, Maria, because I think this way you're not taking no for an answer, right? And a lot of that is the, one could say that a leap of, let's start with your husband first, the leap that he made from being a special ed teacher to being running a massage envy. And I know you have since expanded it, not just one or two now, you're number two. I, I think you have two now. We have two, yeah, 75 employees. So that jump is not something that anyone is born with, right? Some are, some maybe, but most of you, most of us have to learn it. A lot of that jump happens because of your belief, because of your faith. It does not happen because you know everything. That's a lot right. of us have been, especially the analytical ones, and our show is first and second generation immigrants, and I'm from India, we're trained to be analytical. That's how we're doing so well in the tech world, in the valley, because that's how we're trained. doesn't mean we're better than anyone, it's just that's how training is. When I had to go look at my journey of trying to shift from being a corporate employee to now running my own job, or I call it as corporate slave to be master of my own destiny, it could work either ways, but at least I drive it now. The biggest fear is always, I don't know enough. That's right. right. Yeah. And how did your husband overcome at that? Because I'm sure you guys had discussion. You're leaving a stable job of being a teacher. You have a potential pension coming in. And you're risking everything. So when you were looking, when he was looking to switch, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, I mean, he had done multiple other things as well. You know, he had done the corporate route, figured out he hated that, could never be home with the family, right? There was good money there, right. but hated it. Teaching, he loved, especially the special needs students, he loved that. But the income's not the appreciation from parents, unfortunately. Yeah. There's a lot of issues there. So he had started some other businesses in the past, and they hadn't done as well. But I think... If you have the support of a spouse that can pick up when you're not doing so well or vice versa. So as I left my job, I knew he was there to have my back. And when he right. left his job, I had had his back. So I think having that partnership really helps. And then I think it helps to be born with the, how hard can it be, Gene? Like, we'll just figure yes. it out. <laughs> yes. Because you can't yes. know it all before you get in there. And no. then, of course, this was also a franchise, and there's a lot of support in franchises. They want you to do well. They don't want you to fail. Correct. So they have support to teach you what to do. So How did you make a decision it? on Massage Envy? I mean, I love Massage Envy. I'd probably <laughs> give you guys, if you were in Raleigh, I would give you a lot of the business. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember where it was. I think I was sitting in a doctor's office, maybe in a waiting room, and picked up an entrepreneurial magazine. Somewhere I picked mm -hmm. up an entrepreneurial magazine. And they had a list of the top 10 new up and coming franchises. Right. And I saw family at the time was number two or three on the list. I just went to my husband and said, what do you think about opening a massage envy? And he goes, I don't know a darn thing about massages. I don't want to give people massages. So I'm like, no, you hire people. I was there best to do that part. You run the business. <laughs> it's not and, the uh, how, it's the who. It just kind of went from there. We sent off for some information and uh, 
said, yeah, is this going to work? And then it was like, well, there's a pretty hefty price tag. Where's that coming from? And it's like real estate. That's awesome. Let's recap on your journey and then we'll go forward. So you had real estate before even you started your career. So you were an investor from beginning and you're an entrepreneur from being, you just happened to be a wildlife biologist along the way. But I consider right. you as an investor to begin with, right? And what you did was, which is amazing, and you didn't see it in the exact terms, but I think this is going to be right, as in whatever capital you had, you used the capital to buy real estate. And that real estate had cash flow and appreciation and tax benefits at that time. But you used all of that to buy a business, which then produced income, and which is probably already appreciated in value as well if you were to sell them. That's a different positive of that. But right. then you bought the income from the businesses to buy more real estate to give you more tax benefits to reinvest in the business. I love this flywheel. <laughs> it is wonderful, right? Let me just make sure people get the grasp of it. If you don't, I just repeat it. And if you still don't get it, make sure you rewind it. Because what we're saying is the journey for the cash is usually two ways. And most of the people are going to take is the income comes in. I need to buy the biggest house. I need to buy the best car. I need to buy the, send my kids to the best school. I need to live in the best. Now, whatever your want is, it becomes a need, especially if you have that kind of cash flow coming in, right? So that's one. Income comes in, cash comes in, and cash goes out and done. But what Maria has done is what my mentor, which a lot of people's mentor, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, tells you is basically trying to create the income where your income from whatever source of the income is coming in, it's turning into cash flow. That cash flow is turning into an asset that's, that's generating another revenue. And then you're using that, if you're smart like Maria, you'll use that to buy more real estate that gives you another way of cash flows. So now your income streams are also diversified. Something were to happen to the massage envy, Maria is not a single point of failure in her case. There's different multiple streams of income. If that goes down, there's real estate. If the real estate market is going down, the business is there, right? So she can tap into two different sources of income. And I love that. And these things with uh, Maria, to your earlier premise, it's going to work with or without you because you have 75 employees, right? If something were to happen to you and your husband tomorrow, those employees are trained. Yeah, you need to have some sort of a plan to make sure who takes over, which is fine. But eventually the business is running already with or without you. You just happen Thank to be you there. right now. Yeah, we've got managers in place that take care of 99% of everything that has to happen. That cycle you talked about, because it's, it's actually even better than that, because you said capital buys the real estate, real estate buys the business and, and vice versa. But actually, capital didn't even buy the real estate. A lot of that we did with no money down. And there's a hundred ways you can do that. There you we go. started with lease options. And then, of course, during 2006, seven, and eight, you were able to buy real estate with no money yeah. out of pocket. So we had done some of what that as well. Them? Ninja loans, no income, no <laughs> job. Oh my God. Well, uh, I looked back at some of the loans we had gotten and I'm like, what were these banks thinking? I mean, we were qualified buyers, but the same bank gave us the 80% loan and then they gave us a 20% line of credit on top yeah, of it for the down payment. Yeah. I'm like a HELOC or I whatever you want. I had bought one property, Maria, at that time, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but that was leverage. The time I bought it, I had put 110% leverage on it. I knew <laughs> I wouldn't go under because I had the cash to support it in the bank. I just didn't mm -hmm. want to put the money in the bank. But for folks, this is where the financial IQ comes in. You have to make sure just because something is available, you, can't, you shouldn't just jump into it. You have to understand the risks behind it and what happens when the gravy train runs out. Eventually it does are you going to be able to sustain it, right? And if you can, like some people that keep asking me about a question about Airbnb, should I buy Airbnb? I worked at the company for about five years. What should we do? Should we buy it? I'm like, you should definitely buy anything you want to buy. The problem is, can you keep it? Is it going to produce enough cash flow to make sure when the vacancy goes up that you have enough cushion to sustain it? You know, Absolutely. eventually it'll all go up. Mm -hmm. But eventually is a long-term horizon. We're not talking about two years, two months, we're talking about 20, 30, 40 years out, real estate is going to pan out. But it's just that, are you going to be able to keep it with you if your loan's bigger than your cash flow and you have no other source of income coming in and that was the only way to pay? Now you're risking a foreclosure, right? And that's where you have to be smarter. And I know we're shifting, we went on a tangent there, but I just wanted <laughs> to make sure I harp on that, that no money downs and other approaches are great. And I would love for you to explore what Maria said but this show, we're not telling you strategies to do for you. That was Maria's strategy 
You should get inspiration from that strategy, but don't blindly follow it because we need to make sure that it works for you and the markets you're in and you know how to buy it and you know how to keep it so you can take advantage of that. So enough said on that. So Maria, now you are out of your job, right? You bought some small multifamilies and all that good stuff. Fast forwarding 2022, 2023. What do you do now? Well, now I start following passion again, because although real estate is fun and everything you do, uh, it's only so exciting to stare at an apartment complex and think about tenants and all that kind of stuff and make things nice for them. What started this whole journey was my son and the whole autism situation. Like you said, parents worry. What happens when I'm not around? Not only where do they get finances from, their money from, but where are they going to live? Who's going to take care of them? Who's going to make sure that they are safe? that they have a job, that they make friends so they're not lonely. The suicide and depression rate in this population is extremely high. Mm -hmm. So there are all those other worries. And I felt like I hadn't addressed that from my son. And I was hearing the same thing from countless parents. So I said, well, then I already do the real estate thing. And I already know the autism thing. Let's put those together. So I founded a nonprofit called Valhalla Villas, the Viking heaven, if you will. You know, the Norsk uh, mythology there. Right, Uh, right. My other uh, business is Blue Vikings Capital. So it's all tied together because I'm an immigrant as well. I immigrated from Sweden. So I've got that Viking blood running through my veins. So I founded this nonprofit to provide housing for autistic adults. And that would have all those services integrated, a lot of the support that these individuals basically rely on their parents for. Because a lot Mm -hmm. of them are really, really close to being able to live completely independent. They just need a little, little bit more. And so we can be there to provide that little bit more. That's awesome. Tell me more about that project because you lit up as soon as you started talking. So I know it's a passion (laughs) for you. I don't know how many people are going to see the video, but you should look back when we're talking about other things and we talk about this project. Maria just lit up. No, this is something I'm really excited about. So it's still uh, young. We're still getting off the ground, but we are looking at development right now in Bradenton, Florida. For anybody who's in Florida, you might know where that is, but it's kind of between Orlando, Tampa area, closer to Tampa, but really nice area. So there's a development there. They were just going to build a standard 96 unit apartment complex. But then the county said, you know, if you provide some affordable housing as part of this mix, then we'll let you build 200 units. And that's happening more and more across the country. So that's where there's a need for affordable housing. And it just so happened that one of the developers has an autistic child and he had heard about my program. So he reached out and said, you know, would you be one instead of just having regular affordable housing here? Can we bring in the autism housing model because they need affordable housing. And uh, we put that in here. So 25% of that complex, if all works out, knock on wood, will be for autistic adults. And so we'll bring the services into that community. It'll be integrated with the regular tenants. So they don't feel like they're living in, you know, special needs housing necessarily. And they get that socialization with other tenants as well. So just be a nice community feel. I'm really excited about that project. I think that's going to go really well. And then we have some things in the work with the University of Central Florida, working on a partnership there where they currently have students, autistic individuals who come to the University of Central Florida to live sort of a student life. And Mm -hmm. they live in dorms right there on campus. They take classes. Now, these are classes more along the lines of learning independent living skills. So it teaches them that while they're living in a dorm with another college student who is not on the autism spectrum, just a regular student. So they kind of get integrated into that life. And then they need some place for those kids to go after they graduate there. You know, where's the next transition, the next housing where they'll still have their back, still have their housing. So we're looking for apartment complexes or new developments where somebody wants to bring in this model around the University of Central Florida. And then once we have those yeah. models in place and we prove that it works, we want to take it nationwide. That's awesome. But I'm pretty sure it works. I think if you've given your background and your passion, I'm pretty sure you'll figure it out. If this <laughs> model doesn't work, you'll figure out another model. So it's, it's a matter of time before people start hanging. Now, is anyone else doing this, Maria, or you're the only one so far? I'm the only one I know of that's doing it in this particular fashion. And the reason I chose to go this route is because the need is tremendous. So Mm -hmm. I was saying uh, there was one in every 44 kids in the United States is now being diagnosed with autism, but the center of disease control just came out with the new statistics is now one in 36, or I'm sorry, 36 out of every hundred, not one in 36. Got it. Got it. Got it. 
I just saw that on the news, so I need to check that. But it's just the point is it's really on the rise. Demand is incredible for Wait, this. Are we saying 36% of the newborn kids? One in every 36 kids born in the United States is now diagnosed with autism. So I just checked it because I had a note on my wow. phone there. So, yeah, I mean, incredible. And it, it used to be like one in 200 only 10 years ago. So it's really on the rise. We don't really know why. But this need is not going away anytime soon. And so the other model that we've seen other people build um, special needs housing is through government funding mm-hmm. where they get grants to do this. They have to come up with the money to buy the land. And then Florida housing in our case, but you know, it's federal and state funds combined can pay for the build out of the community. And then it's a all sorts of special needs individuals, but all of them are special. They all have separate needs. Someone with Down syndrome doesn't have the same yeah. needs as someone with cerebral palsy or autism. So it's really hard to do that when it's so broad. So I think it's easier to focus on one population. So I hope there will be others that will focus on Down syndrome or cerebral palsy right. or one, any of these other, there's so many different needs, right? But we're choosing to focus on autism. But going that route, it's a lot of competition for those grants. There's only one per year. You have to meet a lot of criteria. And it usually takes about six years to get one of those developments off the ground. If we're building stuff, we can probably build in 18 to 24 months. If we're buying pre-existing stuff, we can do it as quickly as we can close on that building. It lets us go a lot faster. So I'm the only one that I know that's doing it from the private sector, but having the real estate syndication background helps me do that. I'm familiar with capital raising. I do capital raising now for projects I'm personally investing in. I don't do capital raising for things I'm not involved in. But yeah, so figured can put those together and make this go fast because we need it. Awesome. So Maria, let me just make sure. I think the major distinction is that you can get state funded or you can do private funded. The route that you're taking is a private funding and what that model looks like, and tell me if I'm saying it wrong, is you partner with a builder, in this case specifically in Bradenton, Florida, you said. And what you're doing there is you have the land, you have the builder, you have everything there. Now you need the capital to make it all happen. So what you go out to is you go out to the private world where you're talking to people like me and you and saying that, hey, we have this project, invest alongside with us, and these are the returns that you're looking to get. Exactly, exactly. And so there are two different models there, right? You can invest in just the build out. Builders typically they build and then they sell almost immediately, Mm -hmm. right? And then somebody else buys it. So if you want quick return on your money, you can invest there in the development. And then if you want to say you have a special needs job and you want to make sure they're set up forever, right? You could invest in the long term hold of that property where it will cash flow for your child forever. Because once we buy these places, we're not planning on ever selling. Right. Got it. And you have very sticky tenants, which is a good thing for your bottom line, too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, vacancy is one of the biggest things that can hurt your bottom line. People with autism hate change. They're happy there. They're staying. So that's a really good thing from a business standpoint. And then you're doing something really good socially. So it's a way to really feel good about your investments and knowing that they're going to be there forever. And we can still refinance and get people their capital back, their original mm-hmm. investment. So you can still go invest that somewhere else, but continue to have cash flow from this in perpetuity. Do you have a plan in place if somebody had an autistic child, they want to invest in it, but they want to have their child live in that place eventually? Is that an option in your plan? Well, every resident would have to meet certain screening criteria. We could not guarantee parents that their child would have a place there just because they invested in it. I don't think that's fair to the other tenants. They have to meet the affordable housing criteria as well as our criteria. They have to be ready to live independently. But to that point, through Valhalla Villas, through the nonprofit, we are producing programs for people to learn to be ready to live independent, right? So we have sort of a checklist of things you're going to need to be able to live in one of these units. So you can go through some training to get your child to that point. So This is amazing. What you're doing is such so needed. It seems, especially when you share that stat, that's almost 30% of the population, which is crazy. So thank you for doing what you're doing, right? And I really appreciate that. And if there's anything we can support, let us know, of course. Thank you. What's next? Is this the path for now? This is the path for now. Yes, yes. We're going to just keep improving this model, get some really great communities going out there, and then try to find partners to help us take it everywhere. Because can't do this alone. Going to need lots of partners along the way. Well, Maria, this has been great. Thank you again for sharing your journey. Thank you for being open to bring your raw side out. That's what the show is all about. Try to make sure that we can share these real stories and not just step one to step 10 framework. 
because framework they can learn everywhere. It's the people story because that's what's going to make the listeners move in terms of taking the next action, right? And then they can figure out what they, where they can find the steps. So I appreciate that, Mario. We want to respect for your time. We're coming towards the close of our sh- episode here. We always end with two questions. The first question is going to be looking back at your life. I think I kind of know one answer. One potential answer to the next question is looking back, what would your advice to your 20-year-old self be? 20-year-old self. Okay, so that would have been before I had kids. I guess you can't prep yourself for what's to come there because you would have no no idea. But I guess I'll keep following the passions because they're going to drive you in the right direction. Don't be afraid to follow those passions. You'll figure it out. Now, I love that, right? Because most of the thing is like, my passion is not making me money. Figure it out. You did it. You figured it out. How hard can Um, it be? I love that, right? I've lived my entire life. How hard can it be? It is very hard sometimes, but how hard can it be, right? (laughs) It's not impossible. Last question for the show is going to be more around, as you reflect back, right, on, on everything that's happening around you, around the world, where do you feel humanity as a whole should migrate in the next two to four decades? I think we really need to start paying attention to climate change. Maybe that's the wildlife biologist in me still talking, but we see it in the wildlife community already. We see the effects that are happening there and we're not immune to that as humans. So we really need to start taking that seriously. It's going to have an effect on where we all live. So that ties in with your real estate. It's going to have effect on all the natural resources we need to live well. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree with more on that, but thank you Maria for all your insights, all your wisdom today. We really appreciate you. If somebody wants to learn more about your project, about your nonprofit, where can they find you? ValhallaVillas.org. And if you can't spell that, you can also go to Blue Vikings Capital. That's my other business, BlueVikingsCapital.com, and hit on the Giving Back button, and I'll take you to all those links. Perfect. We'll make sure the link is included. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Maria, thanks again. We will talk to you soon, and good luck with all the stuff that you're trying to do. Thank you so much for having me. If you got value from this episode, you might consider sharing this content with a friend. But most importantly, be sure to take action on what you've learned. One way you can take the next step is to connect directly with Socket on an investor call. That link is waiting for you in the show notes below. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Please consult your own advisors when making any investment decisions. Keep listening. We'll see you on the next episode.